Please be seated. We welcome those of you who are joining us via live stream. And once again, for those who are here, please be sure that the cell phones have been turned off. We're going to begin the funeral service for Scott Evans Silver, whereby Philip Sherman and Cantor Jennifer Frost will be officiating. Ecclesiastes wrote, The eye never has its fill of seeing. Young or old who depart this life never see enough of the world, never complete their task, never cherish their loved ones enough before they are called home. How they yearn for yet another respite from the final summons, and how we yearned to have them close to us for yet another challenge in our lives, yet another joy, yet another precious moment together. God, be now with those whose hearts are broken, because whenever parting comes, it comes too soon. Console them at this moment. Be near to them with light when light seems distant. Sustain them, O God until a time of healing. So as we gather in this sacred space to remember Scott, a space filled with our Jewish tradition that meant so much to him, there are so many painful feelings and emotions we bring with us. There is the deepest despair, shock, anger, pain, and brokenness. When we gather in a community, and when we gather as a sacred community, especially at a synagogue, it is customary to greet one another with a word of shalom, of peace, or of goodness. But there's no goodness in this moment. For there's nothing right about our gathering today. We shouldn't be here It's not the way things should go. There's a profound sense of brokenness here. When we say shalom, we also imply a sense of wholeness of which there is none right now. 
And the shattered wholeness that we feel in this moment creates many broken pieces. These broken fragments that we hold right now will never return to the same form as before. But what exists in those empty spaces, in the fractures and between those pieces, is memory. It's the stories, it's the love, it's the comfort that you have shared and will continue to share as a community together. It is in this way we pray that the Silver family will one day begin to see a new kind of whole, one that has been held up and held together by memory and an abundance of care and love. In this moment, there is enough pain and despair that we risk understanding Scott's life only as defined by his death and not for the fullness of who he was as a person. And so it is that we must remember Scott for all who he was. A loving son, a caring brother, a deeply adoring father and a devoted uncle and a truly kind friend. Scott wanted to share all that was good in life. He wanted to experience it himself, but he wanted perhaps even more to share it with others. He used every sense that he had to experience the fullness of life and in doing so, bringing goodness to others. Scott wanted to create memories from an early age with his parents and his siblings, with his friends, and most of all, with his three children, who he loved more than anything. Scott was a cultivator of memory. And I find it so incredibly powerful that that is the responsibility that we now have as the living, that is to hold these memories that Scott helped create for us and with us as an enduring reminder of his legacy and his presence in our lives. These memories fill empty spaces that exist in your world. Memories of his loving and genuine nature, his knowledge of statistics of nearly all things, especially sports and the top 100 golf courses, his family shared with me a memory of Scott being on the front page of the Chicago Tribune as a first grader, having coded a new Apple III that was in their family home. Never on social media, Scott wanted to connect in person. His connections with each of you were the lights that helped bring meaning and purpose to his life. And Scott was so proud of his children. He loved going on adventures with Brett and at Logan and Noah's B'nai Mitzvah. I remember watching him right here on this very bima and the pride that he had that I saw connecting one generation to the next. The memories he forged and created and encoded for all of you, these will not be lost or forgotten. And so many of us are here because we were touched by Scott's way of being in the world. Scott was always sincerely interested in the lives of others and shared that love and curiosity with those around him. May you share these connections with Scott's family and allow these memories to be and become a source of healing and comfort. We are deep within the Hebrew month of Kislev, a month where darkness is very present. With the light of the Hanukkah candles, which we will light in just a few days, we do so as a reminder to lift up the goodness in our lives and illuminate the possibility for wholeness in our world. And as you all sit amidst the darkness for your family, no, you are surrounded by a community that seeks to lift up the light and blessing of Scott's memory, and in doing so, extending you all comfort and strength. 
Let our silence in this moment reach out to the Silver family. Let their tears fall on us. Let their anger break against us. Let our love and our deeds speak for us. God of comfort, you who heal the brokenhearted and bind up their wounds, grant comfort and consolation to these mourners as they face their grief. Fill their lives with acts of loving kindness and truth which serve as a genuine memorial to Scott. That deep bond of love that will remain unbroken. And so in this moment of profound sadness, we look to the words of our tradition, which for millennia have served as a source of comfort. And we find meaning on this day, linking Scott's life with the long and proud history of our people and the traditions we find among them. So Cantor Frost shared these words in Hebrew as we began our service, but the words of Psalm 121, I lift my eyes to the mountains. What is the source of my help? My help comes from Adonai, maker of heaven and earth. God will not let your foot give way. Your protector will not slumber. See, the protector of Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. God is your guardian. God is your protection at your right hand. The sun will not strike you by day nor the moon by night. God will guard your soul, your going and coming now and forever. In the pamphlet you received when you entered this morning, this afternoon, I invite you to open and as we turn to the words of the 23rd Psalm, which introduces us in these words to a God who is with us in our loss and leads us through the valley of the shadow of death and back into light. Let us share these words together. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Adonai roi lo exar bino de shayar bitseni al me menuchot al me menuchot yenahaleni Nafshi yashovev yashovev Yancheni v'magilei tzadak Yancheni v'magilei tzadak Leman neshemo Gam ki eilech begeit sal mavet lo hirara ki ata imadi shiv techa umi shanet techa hey ma yanachamu. Taroch lefanai, lefanai, shulchan neged zorai. Dishan tav Hashem en roshi, kosi revaya. 
Ach, Tauber, wach es said, jede Funi. Kolje mei, chayai. Kolje mei, chayai. Beschaub dir, Yamim Adonai Roi Lo Echsar Adonai Roi Lo Rabbi Alvin Fine once wrote, Birth is a beginning and death a destination and life is a journey. From childhood to maturity and youth to age, from innocence to awareness and ignorance to knowing, from foolishness to discretion and then perhaps to wisdom, from weakness to strength or strength to weakness and often back again. From health to sickness and back we pray to health again. From offense to forgiveness, from loneliness to love. From joy to gratitude, from pain to compassion and grief to understanding. From fear to faith, from defeat to defeat to defeat. Until looking backward or ahead, we see that victory lies not at some high place along the way, but in having made the journey, stage by stage, a sacred pilgrimage. Birth is a beginning and death a destination, and life is a journey, a sacred pilgrimage to life everlasting. So this afternoon, we'll have the opportunity to hear from many members of Scott's family offering words of eulogy. Ariel, I invite you to come forward first. It means so much to have everyone here today to honor Scott. Scott was intelligent with a quick wit. He was also very honest and strong-willed. I like playing board games, and several times when he lived with us, I'd ask him to play Rummy Cube or chess with me, and he always had the same Larry David type of reply, I'll pass, I don't like games. Scott was a food connoisseur. Ochoa's in Deerfield had the best tacos, the super taco. Whenever I was in New York, I had to get an Essa bagel, and I had to eat at Pugin's Porch in Charleston. He was an avid golfer and a lifelong Cubs fan. Go Cubs. Scott was a very likable guy. He had a great group of friends, many of whom are here. He easily made new friends and was warm and kind to everyone he met. Scott loved his family and friends. He loved his children, Logan, Noah, and Brett, more than anything in the world. And he adored his nieces, Drew, Winnie, Dylan, and Sloan. He had a special bond with each of them. Whenever Sloan and Brett would play zombies together, I'm sorry, excuse me. Whenever Sloan and Brett would play together, they begged him to play zombies, where Uncle Scott would chase him, them around the house as a zombie with his arms out. <laughs> Once, Drew, Robbie and Lexi's four-year-old, was eating chicken at a family dinner, and Uncle Scott asked her if, he, if she liked chicken in the belly, and he started tickling her. <laughs> And that turned into a long-standing game, the uh, chicken in the belly game. And Drew would always ask for that. They will remember him as their fun-loving uncle. Scott loved life, and he loved making memories. As we try to process and cope with this tragic loss, 
I'm reminded of a prolific Jewish psychiatrist, Viktor Frankl. Incredibly, Frankl survived the Holocaust by developing a theory, logotherapy, which is the ability to find meaning in tragic events. Frankl saw firsthand that those in concentration camps who were focused on a meeting to be fulfilled were more likely to survive the atrocities. Those able to connect with a purpose in life to feel positive about, like for example, having a conversation with an imaginary loved one, increased their odds of survival. In other words, they gained healing through searching for meaning. At one point, Frankel's book, Man's Search for Meaning, was named one of the 10 most influential books in the United States. But what does a search for meaning mean? Author and subject matter expert David Kessler describes meaning as relative and personal. Only you can find your own meaning. Finding a meaning takes time. You may not find it until months or even years after a tragedy. And meaning doesn't require understanding. It is not necessary to understand why someone died in order to find meaning. I wish I could stand here today and tell you what the meaning is of losing Scott. I don't have the answers today. But my hope is that in time, we as Scott's family and friends can find our own personal meaning and find light out of darkness. To Scott, I love you. I'll cherish all of our memories together. I will continue to search for meaning and I promise to honor your life. Lexi. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Lexi. I was Scott's sister, um, not by blood. Uh, I'm married to his brother, but on the rare occasion he had to introduce me to someone, he would just say sister. So uh, that's what I'm doing. <laughs> Scott, Ariel, and I were part of the oldest child club in the Silver family. We all bonded over the highs and lows of paving the way. And Scott and I compared the ins and outs of our <clears throat> enthusiastic middle siblings. <laughs> Scott was there the first night my relationship with his brother Robbie began. It was 2003, and when I came to their door to ask Robbie to the GBS turnabout dance, Scott was peering with his dad through the curtains in the window, delighting in watching his baby brother serenaded by a group of girls. I didn't meet Scott that night, but when I finally did get to spend time with Robbie's family, <clears throat> it made me feel more secure. Like, oh yeah, I could see a future with this family, I could survive family dinners, I could spill the tea with these people, and that was in great part due to Scott. Scott always made me feel comfortable, even though I was the newbie. He genuinely cared about my interests and wanted to get to know me and make me feel like part of the crew already, like an insider. The way Scott spoke to people made you feel like old friends catching up, and I've heard that this week from a number of people he came across in life. It was a pleasure watching Scott go from bachelor to doting father and then uncle. It was always so important to him to be part of the action, but not the center of attention. Scott was the kind of uncle who beamed with pride in the things his niece has accomplished. Over the last two years of his life, Scott was faced with a mountain of never-ending adversity, but he was still a present, joyful uncle, even in his times of strife. Even during the most painful days in his life, he was goofy Uncle Scott, building memories with my kids. He was there in the hospital when my second daughter was born, and although Winnie won't remember him, we will never stop telling stories about Scott. He was there for every major and minor event in their lives, regardless of what was happening in his, and I will always cherish the memory of his presence. 
when I was pregnant with both girls, he always, always was the first one to ask if I needed anything. If I wanted to sit down, to make myself comfortable. I didn't always appreciate it at the time. Like, for real, Scott, I can take care of myself, thank you. <sighs> but I will never take that for granted about his character. Going out of his way to make sure we're comfortable, taken care of, and feeling his love, just like the big brother he was. The last thing I want to share is my very final memory of Scott. He was over at our house, he had slept over the night before, and we had breakfast tacos together that Robbie made. And as he was about to leave, my four-year-old cried out, Uncle Scott, don't leave, play with me. He said he was sorry he had to go, but we asked if she wanted to hug him before he went. She gave him a huge two-arm hug, almost flying into him. It's the kind of hug my daughter only reserves for the very most special in her life. That hug is rare and so full of love. That's how I'll remember Scott. He was a man deserving of a flying two-arm hug, and all I want to do more than anything right now is give him one. Life can be extremely unfair. I think all of us being here today proves that, but I plan to revel in the joyful, beautiful moments and remember him for who he truly was and how he would want us to remember him. Let's call forward John. Sorry for the long, dramatic entrance there. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is John, uh, and Scott and I uh, were best friends. Um, Scott and I met back in 1992 uh, during our freshman year of high school. Or as his brother Brian would like to point out, we technically met back in 1983 <clears throat> when Brian managed to unearth a photo that would live in infamy. <clears throat> and it's been the topic of much ridicule to this day. Got some ridicule on it yesterday, <clears throat> to be clear. Uh, <clears throat> there were the two of us, a couple little five-year-old Jews, side-by-side side in sequins and top hats, with labored smiles, and this was just the beginning of two legendary figure skating careers. <laughs> From that point, Scott became obsessed with skating. Okay, just kidding. We both retired shortly after that photo was taken, but just to have that photo made it all worth taking figure skating lessons. Anyway, our friendship actually took off at Glenbrook South High School, where we became fast friends with so much in common, Cubs, Bulls, Bears, golf, hip hop, food, Jewish culture, and a passion for what the kids call chillin'. And to the older ones here, that's relaxing. Uh, Scott and I shared our love of chillin' with a group of guys who could also hold their own when it came to chillin', including Dave Mokhtarian, Alex Farquhar, Brian Raff, Uday Segal, Henry Lee, and Derek C. In fact, we loved chilling so much that we dubbed ourselves the NAC, which is short for the No Activities Club. Together, we embarked on a lifelong quest to engage in as few activities as possible. And when we'd actually make an effort to do an activity, such as taking a, a boys' trip somewhere, We'd rent a house, and you guessed it, we did absolutely nothing. And there was nobody I'd rather do nothing with more than Scott. He always had such a positive attitude, and he was always down for a good time. We experienced so many of life's firsts together, and some of which I can't mention here. We laughed together, golfed together, commiserated about Chicago sports failure together. Went to Wrigley Field in 2016 when the Cubs beat the Dodgers to finally get to the World Series and so many more memories that I'll never forget. In addition to his commitment to chilling, Scott also was an amazingly hard worker and was always super driven. So much so that even during the summers, he'd take internships 
and have to leave the party early so he can get up and go to work at the crack of dawn. And it paid off as he later enjoyed a fantastic career that I was always in awe of. But most importantly, Scott was a fantastic dad. He was always engaged. He always doted on his kids. He was a loving brother to Brian and Robbie, a loving uncle, and a loving son who always honored his parents. He talked about his family with so much adoration, and they shaped him into just an excellent human being. And I appreciate the Silver family for giving us the gift of Scott. Scott, you were one of my best friends, and you will always be in my heart. I wish my deepest condolences to the Silver family, who are also like my family growing up. And please know that if you ever need to talk, me and the rest of the NAC, we'll, 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 we're always there for you. And I love you, Scott and I look forward to figure skating with you again soon, my friend. Thank you all for being here. Brian and I knew Scott more intimately than anyone. So just quickly, before we start, I do want to briefly address the last two years of Scott's life because, you know, it's the elephant in the room. And he at least deserves to have his truth said out loud. Scott did not want to die. He wanted to live. He loved his family. And he wanted to be with them every chance he could get for decades to come. And Scott did not die because of mental illness. He was not sick. He was suffering because of unbelievably awful conditions put on him. There was pain that was relentlessly and unjustly inflicted upon Scott, and he just wanted that to end. He just wanted peace. Death was what he saw as his only solution to a problem that seemingly had no other remedy. It was the only way he felt that he could stop the suffering and find that peace. Okay, let's talk about Scott. Scott was an incredible brother. Even though we were seven and a half years apart, he was my tied for best friend. We confided in each other. We uplifted each other. We made fun of each other, but he was so supportive of me as his baby brother. When we were kids, all three of us, baseball was the most important sport to us. Scott and Brian were pretty good, but I sucked. <laughs> Even though I was trash, I loved the game, and Scott on many occasions would patiently pitch tennis balls to me against our garage. I would mostly swing and whiff, but he stuck with me, helping me adjust my stance and throwing pitch after pitch to me. And on the rare occasion I actually got a hit, nobody cheered louder for me than Scott. He also taught me how to golf, and he spent many hours in our front yard and at the range, patiently teaching me the mechanics of the swing. He was a friend and a teacher all at once, and his love and support for me always felt bottomless. <clears throat> Scott loved experiencing life, which is something other people have noted too. He didn't seek to be the center of attention. He just wanted to be part of the experience. 
He wanted to make and share memories with the people he loved. One of my best days ever as a kid was because of Scott. It was September 24th, 2002. I had to look that date up, but Scott remembered every date. And while I was in my first period of the day at Glenbrook South, Scott called the school pretending to be my dad. This is Howard Silver. I need to call my son Rob out for a family emergency. The family emergency started with the two of us going to Sluggers to hit some balls and get some lunch. Then we went to Wrigley Field for a Cubs game with great seats, of course. He was a bit of a seat snob. Then we got Spanish tapas for dinner at Cafe Babariba. As Ariel mentioned, he loved good food. And then at night, we saw Paul McCartney at the United Center. And Scott loved being the witness to greatness. And this was my first Beatles concert, which many of you know is a big deal for me. And what made this Ferris Bueller type day best of all wasn't one particular thing we did that day. It's that Scott wanted to do it with me. He wanted to spend time together and create these memories. Later on, Scott had kids of his own, and his kids to the very end were the most important thing in his life by far. He was such a present dad. Sometimes he would work the overnight shifts, and when work was done in the morning, his second shift would start, this time as a dad. Scott worked so hard to make sure his kids were happy and well taken care of. He wanted to give them everything he could. Not just physical things, but also his time. Just the same way he and I practiced baseball and golf many years earlier, I saw him beam with pride as he got to pass on those same lessons and so much more with Noah, Logan, and Brett. To finish, I want to touch a bit more on golf. Scott loved it. And as brothers, the three of us had so many special rounds together, usually thanks to Brian's connections, Palm Springs, Pinehurst, Firestone. Thanks, Bri. We would usually ride in golf carts, but oftentimes we would be about 150 yards out from the green, and Scott would hit his approach shot. And if it was a good shot, instead of getting back in the cart, Scott would stand there for a moment, then take his putter and say, I'll walk. And he'd start walking with a slow, steady strut to the green. I believe these short walks are when Scott was at the most peace in his entire life. He wanted to soak in the experience to the fullest. He told us he wanted to feel the ground under his feet as he took each step. The subtle undulation of the fairway. He would look around as he walked, and I could see him taking in the natural beauty. He would listen to the sounds of nature and breathe in the fresh air around him. This was his meditation, and this was where he felt the most at peace. And I'd like to imagine that finally he's able to feel this peace once again. I'd like to call forward Brian. Younger brother always has to show me up, doesn't he? Um, 
First of all, I do want to say that while everybody was great to Scott over the last couple of years, there were a few people that really went above and beyond for Scott besides our family. And so, uh, Cousin Jeff, Cousin Mike, thank you for what you did for Scott. Dan, I've never met Dan before, but you're here somewhere, Dan, and uh, you were amazing. What you did for my brother and what you did for me and Robbie and the conversations we would have about what Scott was telling you helped us so much. And so, Dan, wherever you are, thank you. And to my wife, Arielle, um, thank you for what you did to Scott. Many people may not know that Scott lived with us for the better part of a year. And while I was at work, having a great time at the club, Ariel would be the one that would be there talking to Scott and listening to him and caring for him and really took it upon herself to make sure Scott was safe and fed and so many things. And so I just want to say thank you to you too. All right. Yo. Microphone check, one, two, what is this? That is the start of one of Scott's favorite songs by A Tribe Called Quest. And as the lyrics say, what is this? This is a celebration of life cut short of someone who loved family and friends more than anything else. It's a reminder to us all that life is very fragile and we should remember to tell those we love just that. Tomorrow is never guaranteed. In a world filled with hatred, be different and show love. That's why we are here. Scott wanted all of you to know he loved you. As the brother closest to Scott in age, and at a time very different from how our kids grow up now, my youth was filled with countless hours of being with Scott. While I'm almost three and a half years younger than him, with how inseparable we were, we could have been thought of as twins. Whether it was breakdancing in the basement, I should have actually changed that white guy did, breakdancing isn't good. Um, spending countless hours taking batting practice on the driveway with the goal of hitting the tennis ball onto the roof of the neighbor's house, or even the occasional fist fight, nearly every memory of my youth was with Scott. 32 years ago, at my speech at his bar mitzvah, I said something that all these years later still stood true when we would fight. Mom gets upset, but Dad says it's okay because we're bonding. If you don't have a brother, you may not understand that statement, but for everyone with a brother, you know exactly what brother bonding is. When Scott, when Scott was on the seven-year-old traveling baseball team, I needed to be his bat boy. When Scott fell in love with golf, I needed to be better than him. When he would get new clothes, I'd have to take them. That's just the way brother bonding was between us. Many of you may not know, but Scott had the unique ability to remember every date. If you had an event, he remembered the date it occurred on. We often joke that he had hyperthymesia, which is the ability that allows people to remember nearly every event in their life with such great precision. Some people may call this highly superior autobiographical memory, but we always thought hyperthymesia sounded way cooler. Whether it's an important date in Cubs history, a family milestone, or even a school play, Scott's memory was incredible and would help us all remember memories from the past. The other night, my brother's friends invited Robbie and I out, and we were laughing at just how stupid some of the dates and events were that he would remember and tell everybody about. They all knew never to argue with Scott when it came to dates and events of the past. Scott's love for his family and friends was what made him the happiest, and nothing made him happier than Noah, Logan, and Brett. He always used to say, I got exactly what I wanted, two boys and a girl. He would love coaching, cooking, hanging out, and just wanted to be present in their lives every chance he could. Even as the divorce continued and the kids were busy with their activities, Scott would do whatever he could to talk or see them. He'd show up to Brett's basketball practices just to have those extra moments with him and would come back home to talk about how great Brett was becoming at basketball. Scott talked like Brett could be a star in the NBA, but me being me, I'd have to bring him back to reality and remind him that Brett's going to be a short Jewish kid from the North Shore and had no shot at the NBA. He never said no to plans with family, loved sitting down with a family member he hadn't seen in a while and catching up, or just making sure everyone was okay. Family reunions, cousins clubs, 
or just ring a doorbell to see if they wanted to chat was something that Scott held so closely. There isn't a family member Scott didn't love. He was an amazing uncle to his four nieces, Dylan, Sloan, Drew, and Winnie. Uncle Scott handled each one of them differently so that each one of them knew that they were, their time with Uncle Scott was special. With my kids, he knew when he talked to Dylan, talked to her about dance, TikTok, boys, basketball, and whatever else was on her mind. But he never got upset when he would, when he would listen to, when he would reply and her face would be in her phone while she was texting friends. And if you don't know my daughter Sloan, she's a pistol and she makes sure everybody knows it. She knew that when she was with Uncle Scott, all rules were off the table. She could stay up late, use her iPad as much as she wanted, and was almost always guaranteed a meal from McDonald's because she could sweet talk Scott like nobody else. The bond my kids had with Uncle Scott was stronger than most. Scott had an impact on so many people's lives and it was great to hear some of these stories over the last few days. Oddly enough, many of these stories started with, since your parents were always working, we were at your house, or we played ping pong for hours right down until the minute your parents came home and then we ran out the back door. Scott and I used our parents' house as ground zero for our friends. I had a friend from long ago send a note that said, I remember at a young age thinking your brother was the coolest. He knew everything about music and he was already going on dates when he was about 13. I remember he always had Z Cav Ricci's on and was the best looking guy I knew. That has to be a faded memory that Scott was the best looking guy we knew. Scott and his friends took, took my friend to his first concert. Oddly enough, it was the Wu-Tang Clan. Many of my friends had their first drink with Scott and a few even had their first experience with what his high school teacher called wacky tobacky with Scott. When my, friends, when my friend Graham was struggling with what he wanted to do in college, it was Scott that listened to him researched information about a major in professional golf management and helped give Graham the support and confidence to switch his major and to do something he loved. Scott only wanted the best for everyone around him. Another tribe called Quest Lyric says, my crew is never ever whacked because we stand strong. Scott's crew for over 25 years, as you heard, were fondly referred to as NAC and consisted of eight guys that to this day have an unbreakable bond. It was the NAC that Scott spent his last night with even making sure to FaceTime John in LA so that he could be part of the chillin' with the rest of the guys. The friendship of the NAC meant everything to Scott. The most influential years of my life revolved around this group chillin' at my parents' house and teaching my friends and I how to be cool with everything without even trying. 16 years ago, one of the NAC members named Derek passed away in a car accident. This was a devastating blow to Scott and the NAC and they were minus one for the last 16 years. When going through his drawers the other day, my mom found the eulogy that Scott gave at Derek's funeral. In the eulogy, Scott talked about Derek's caring personality, his gift of being the best athlete in the NAC, which isn't hard, and his beautiful golf swing, just to name a few. He talked about one of his favorite things to do was their weekly treks around Illinois with Derek himself and Farquhar to all the different golf courses, which almost always ended in Derek killing both of them in golf and Scott and Alex grinding it out to try to break 85. Scott ended the eulogy by saying, so until we meet again, D, I'm gonna keep practicing my golf and try to get my swing half as good as yours. And the next time I see you, we're gonna have some incredible matches. As Scott continued to battle dark thoughts at the end of his life, he kept telling Robbie and I, when I die, please bury me next to Derek. When he took his life on Thanksgiving, Robbie said we must honor his request and Robbie reached out to Derek's parents to tell him Scott's wish. Derek's dad immediately said yes, and Scott will be buried next to his good friend Derek, fellow NAC member. True friendship has no ends or limits, and this proves it. So what do we do next, now that a loved one and friend of so many is physically gone? We keep them alive. Do this through reaching out to my parents and my brother, share stories of Scott with each other, including what Scott would do in the thought process when making decisions, and oftentimes do the opposite of that. And keep thinking about the great times each of us had with him for the first 43 years of his life versus the last two. We all knew Scott was struggling, and each person here did everything they could to try to help him make his life better. But ultimately, it wasn't what he wanted. So Scott, as Robbie called us, we are the odd couple. I'm definitely Felix, the neat and organized freak. 
and you are Oscar, the sloppy sports writer. We were so different, yet exactly the same, and I will always be you, and you will always be me. It's a fearful thing to love what death can touch. A fearful thing to love, hope, dream, to be. To be an O oh, to lose. A thing for fools, this. And a holy thing. A holy thing to love. For your life has lived in me. Your laugh once lifted me. Your word was gift to me. To remember this brings a painful joy. Tis a human thing, love. A holy thing to love what death has touched. This time, as you're able, I invite you to please rise as we join together in words of El Malay Rachamim, words of memory, words of blessing. El maler chamim shochen b'maromim hamsem nuchan chona tachat kanfe hashchina imagerushim o tehorim kezo har haraki amaziri. Ed Nishmach Muachayim Ben Chuna Baruch Velea Brenda Shalach Leola Malar Hamim Yasti Rehu Beseter Knafa Leola Mima Bitzor Bitzor Hachayim Ed Nishmato Adonai Hu God of abundant mercy, God most high. May the soul of our loved one who has gone into eternity find the gift of perfect peace in your embrace, together with the holy and pure whose light shines like the radiance of heaven. Compassionate God, hold him close to you forever so that his soul may be bound up in the bond of life eternal. May he find a home with you and may he rest in peace. Together we say, Amen. Amen. May his memory be an enduring blessing. You may be seated. Ladies and gentlemen, the interment service will continue at Memorial Park Cemetery in Skokie. Shiva will continue here at Congregation BJBE following the interment till 8 p.m. Then at the residence of Brian and Ariel Silver, at 3921 Snowbird Lane in Northbrook, Wednesday from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. Memorial contributions to the Deborah Gelfand Children's Foundation would be appreciated. And for those of you who are joining us via live stream, all this information can be found on the Funeral Homes website. For those of you who will be driving in the funeral procession to the cemetery, the procession will be forming on Frontage Road facing west. Please obtain an orange safety funeral sticker to place on the right-hand side of your windshield. Have your bright lights and hazard lights on at all times. For additional measures of safety, we will be providing a car in the back of the procession to hopefully keep other cars from entering the procession. Please use your horn liberally as you're going through the intersections. Please do not speak or text on your cellular phone while driving to the cemetery. The following people have been asked to serve as pallbearers. When I call your name, please stand next to Scott's casket. Alex Farquhar. Brian Raff, Dave Mokhtarian, Henry Lee, John Heyman, and Uday Segel. 
This time I invite everyone to please rise and stand in place as we escort the casket of Scott Evan Silver from the, from the sanctuary, then you may return to your cars. Once again, I invite the pallbearers to please come forward. Ladies and gentlemen, we ask everyone just to please remain standing as the family, Paul Bears and Scott, leave the sanctuary. This time you may return to your cars. <laughs> 